Good morning. It's uh, always good to see you again on Sabbath via Zoom or in person. I do want you to know if you are able that we are meeting uh, both uh, for Sabbath school and for church outside, uh, just outside the Friendship Center. Um, church begins at 11 o'clock. Sabbath school is uh, starting about 9.45ish. Um, there's just one class or maybe two uh, going on right now that you could join. Uh, we are attempting to slowly uh, bring more and more aspects of our service uh, back and we just hope that you will continue to pray for us as we do that, that we will uh, maintain you know, standards of, of safety that, that will work for us and, and be good for all of us. Uh, but thank you for joining us this morning. We think about uh, the uh, needs of the world right now, so many needs in the world right now, and so many needs amongst those people in our church. Some of you are recovering from sickness or a surgical procedure, and we ask that God will give you a special grace to uh, continue to get better, uh, and we thank you for doing that. Uh, we thank you also for your faithfulness in giving, returning tithes, and giving offerings, especially to the local church budget. Uh, our largest bills, which are uh, payments that we make to the schools uh, as uh, members uh, of each, you know, of Rogers and of Wava, constituent members, uh, we, we give them a great deal of money each month uh, so that they can operate at peak performance. And we hope that you'll uh, help us do that by giving to our local church budget. And then, of course, our insurance bills, they haven't changed a whit. Uh, even if we don't use the building much, we, uh, we still have to pay insurance. So please continue your faithfulness. We appreciate it. We, we do have ministries going on. We are planning on opening Pathfinders in a, in a different way. Uh, and we ask that you would uh, support us as, as we attempt to do this. Well, as I said, thanks for joining us. It's been a really warm week, uh, and today is super hot. Uh, so I hope that you manage to stay cool. Uh, if you learn of someone in the church that's in need of your prayers, would you lift them up to God and ask God to heal them or bless them in some way? Thank you for doing that. Thank you for supporting other people who have a need. We have been uh, studying the book of Genesis, and we are continuing in that study. And so I'm going to do a screen share right now, and we'll get into God's word together. Uh, well, before we do that, how about we have a word of prayer? Father God, thank you so much for being with us this week, uh, for looking after us, for guiding us. Uh, Lord, I pray for those people who are especially in need of your healing touch just now within our church, but also in the community and the world. Uh, but I pray that you would give your, your uh, strength and health to those who are in need of it, that you give comfort as well to those who maybe lost a loved one uh, who are in need of, of encouragement, should they be discouraged in any way. And Father, thank you for looking after those who need um, financial help. And, and I know there are many people that do. Thank you for helping them. Uh, help us to continue to be a conduit to, to help others as best we can. And Father, would you guide our minds as we study your word again and uh, bless us with the insights that you would like us to have things that can transform our lives so that we can be your people in this world right here, right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture dedicates more than 13 chapters to Abraham's story, and almost half of Genesis lays out the narrative of Isaac's son, Jacob. In strong, very strong contrast to this, we readers get barely three chapters where the Bible focuses on Isaac. And even these three chapters include stories of birthright and blessing that Esau and Jacob fight for. 
in the verses that feature them, they steal the limelight away from Isaac, it seems to me. So given, you know, so little narrative space, what impact does Isaac make on salvation history? And that's the question we are attempting to answer today. What impact does Isaac make? And this is God's word to us today, uh, Genesis chapter 26. A severe famine now struck the land, as had happened before in Abraham's time. And so Isaac moved to Gerar, where Abimelech, king of the Philistines, lived. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. I hereby confirm that I will give all these lands to you and to your descendants, just as I solemnly promised Abraham, your father. I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give them all these lands. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men who lived there asked Isaac about his wife, Rebekah, he said, she is my sister. He was afraid to say, she is my wife. He thought they will kill me to get her because she is so beautiful. But sometime later, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out his window and saw Isaac caressing Rebekah. Immediately, Abimelech called for Isaac and exclaimed, she is obviously your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Because I was afraid someone would kill me to get her from me, Isaac replied. How can you do this to us, Abimelech exclaimed. One of my people might easily have taken your wife and slept with her, and you would have made us guilty of great sin. Then Abimelech issued a public proclamation, anyone who touches this man or his wife will be put to death. When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted. For the Lord blessed him, he became a very rich man, and his wealth continued to grow. He acquired so many flocks of sheep and goats, herds of cattle and servants, that the Philistines became jealous of him. So the Philistines filled up all of Isaac's wells with dirt. These were the wells that had been dug by the servants of his father, Abraham. Finally, Abimelech ordered Isaac to leave the country. Go somewhere else, he said, for you have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away to the Gerar Valley, where he set up their tents and settled down. He reopened the wells his father had dug, which the Philistines had filled in after Abraham's death. Isaac also restored the names Abraham had given them. Isaac's servants also dug in the Gerar Valley and discovered a well of fresh water. But then the shepherds from Gerar came and claimed the spring. This is our water, they said, and they argued over it with Isaac's herdsmen. So Isaac named the well Essek, which means argument. Isaac's men then dug another well, but again there was a dispute over it. So Isaac named it Sitna, which means hostility. Abandoning that one, Isaac moved on and dug another well, and this time there was no dispute over it. So Isaac named the place which means open space. For he said, at last, the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper in this land. From there, Isaac moved to Be'er Sheva, where the Lord appeared to him on the night of his arrival. I am the God of your father Abraham, he said. Do not be afraid, for I am with you and I will bless you. I will multiply your descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will do this because of my promise to Abraham, my servant. 
Then Isaac built an altar there and worshiped the Lord. He set up his camp at that place and his servants dug another well. One day, King Abimelech came from Gerar with his advisor, Ahuzat, and also Fecal, his army commander. Why have you come here, Isaac asked. You obviously hate me since you kicked me off your land. They replied, we can plainly see that the Lord is with you. So we want to enter into a sworn treaty with you. Let's make a covenant. Swear that you will not harm us, just as we have never troubled you. We, will, we have always treated you well, and we sent you away from us in peace. And now, look how the Lord has blessed you. So Isaac prepared a covenant feast to celebrate the treaty. They ate and drank together. And early the next morning, they each took a solemn oath not to interfere with each other. Then Isaac sent them home again, and they left him in peace. That very day, Isaac's servants came and told him about a new well they had dug. We found water, they exclaimed. So Isaac named the well Sheva, which means oath. And to this day, the town that grew up there is called Be'er Sheva, which means well of the oath. At the age of 40, Esau married two Hittite wives, Judith, the daughter of Biri, and Basimoth, the daughter of Elon. But, he's, he's, excuse me, but Esau's wives made life miserable for Isaac and Rebekah. This is the big story of Isaac's life as a patriarch. What in this chapter strikes us as worthy of our time? What did God place inside this chapter, inside this story, that uh, is important enough to be included as part of salvation's history? What's so important about this chapter, about Isaac's life? We briefly looked at these verses last week, it seems to me, but now we want to highlight how they reveal to us the impact of God on the births of these two boys, even though God's name is not actually mentioned. Isaac, you'll remember, is the son of promise. God promised Abraham a son, and God delivered. Um, no pun intended. Uh, but not only is there a vast difference between human and divine effort uh, in the birth of these uh, two sons, but also the outcomes of uh, the efforts are quite a bit different, vastly different. But these verses also show to us who was the primary influence in the lives of these two children. We can see uh, this primary influence play out later. Hagar gets a wife for Ishmael, while Abraham is the driving force behind Isaac's marriage. Clearly, we can see who the major influencer was in the lives of each of these two boys, Ishmael and Isaac. Yet, when we read about, you know, Isaac's problem uh, of having uh, children as well, we barely even get to hear Isaac's voice. Uh, throughout the stories that describe his life. I mean, even when Isaac prayed, all we get to do is read Isaac prayed, and that's it. And that's dramatically different, it seems to me, uh, from Abraham, who has many interactions with God and, and other people. We get to hear Abraham's voice quite a bit. Isaac's, not so much. Yet Isaac still shines in the verse on the right, and because he prays for his wife, while his father Abraham stayed focused on his own childlessness. Sarah, or even the phrase Abraham's wife, uh, is not even mentioned. For Abraham, not having a child is all about I, me, and my. Isaac, on the other hand, is the first man in the Bible uh, explicitly described as loving his wife. Now, I'm sure others did, but this is the first time that, you know, uh, it is said that a husband loves his wife in the Bible. 
Um, Isaac is the only patriarch to also have just one wife. Isaac, it seems to me, was setting a new standard in his relationship with Rebecca. It was a, a monogamous standard. It was a loving standard. So now the question is, will others in his family adopt uh, this new standard? Will they be monogamous? Will they be loving with their one wife? But given Isaac's rather quietness in the Bible, you know, we might ask ourselves, can Isaac bear the torch of faith uh, in God and for God? Can he, can he bear that torch? Can he really be the next link in the great covenant that God has made with Abraham's family? This is a covenant that embraces being a blessing to all the peoples of the earth. Can Isaac actually, you know, carry this blessing forward? Or is he too tame, too quiet? The difference between Abraham and Isaac, between what God wants from both of them, at least early on in his relationship with them, has been captured very well in the vast difference between these two commands. The command on the left, God says to Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family. But to Isaac, he says, live here as a foreigner in this land. I mean, leave versus stay. What a vast difference between those two commands. Well, Isaac, you know, I think set some new standards, you know, in how he treated his wife. The fact that he only had one wife. He was still, after all, his father's son. And his early experience of following God's directions regarding, you know, where he should settle uh, did have rather a mixed outcome. Isaac settled into Gerar, but immediately he made the same mistake as his father had twice made earlier. Isaac lied about his true relationship with his wife. He told everyone that they were brother and sister. You know, there are always problems when you tell lies, always problems. For one, I, Rebecca had never been Isaac's sister. You know, Abraham could at least make the claim that Sarah was his half-sister, even though that still, in context, was a lie. But Rebecca had never been Isaac's sister, so that is a big overt lie. And they also have two sons. And both of those kids uh, would be, you know, no doubt learning from their father uh, how to tell a lie as they watched him uh, tell this lie that uh, their mother was actually uh, Isaac's, you know, supposed sister, not his wife. Those boys would have heard that. And Isaac, of course, was seen being intimate in some way with Rebecca. So one of the problems with telling a lie, of course, is the challenge of covering up the true facts in the story. Isaac was not at all successful in doing this, uh, which in many ways is good uh, to to not be able to tell a lie effectively is a good thing, believe it or not. Uh, some of us are way too good at it, and we wish that we had never developed such a skill. Isaac had not. After being discovered, though, by Abimelech, Isaac decided to do something radically different uh, from his shepherd father. And that thing was, that radical difference was he planted a crop. Now, God approved this decision, and he blessed uh, Isaac abundantly. We read that Isaac planted crops that year. He harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted because God had blessed him. This is kind of a, a way in which uh, Isaac began to think, it looks like God wants me to settle down in this area. And uh, growing crops is a way of settling down and not only benefiting the people of the area, but benefiting myself and my family. God approved this decision, and I think that's why he blessed Isaac abundantly. In Mark chapter 10, verses 29 to 30, Jesus said, And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother uh, or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and property along, Jesus said, with persecution. And then in the world to come, that person will also have eternal life. 
So here's, uh, you know, that promise actually worked out in Isaac's life, in the here and now. Isaac gets a hundred times as much. Here is the first time that one of the patriarchs planted and harvested a crop. He harvested a hundred times as much as Jesus said he would. Now, of course, the question becomes, since Jesus also said a person is going to experience persecution, uh, you know, will Isaac experience that? And as we go on in the story, we read that he did. Uh, the fight between his shepherds, uh, his herdsmen, and the herdsmen uh, of the shepherds in Gerar show the kind of persecution that Isaac faced. So he got a hundred times as much, but with the hundred times as much came some trouble, some earthly trouble. By choosing, though, to stay in the land as God had directed him to do, Isaac positioned himself and, and all of his family to settle down even more. To be the patriarch who brought stability to the family line, uh, Isaac accepted this particular role. And that is why he was the first to also plant crops. Isaac brought a much needed stability to Abraham's family line. But why would God bless Isaac, you know, right then? God is often very strange in our minds. I mean, you know, Isaac had just lied to a bunch of people, um, but he had also settled uh, in the land as God had directed him to do. So what's interesting is that God rewarded Isaac for his obedience. He rewarded him immediately with a hundred times as much, you know, crops. But he also allowed Isaac to experience over time the consequences uh, that come when you lie to other people. What consequences, you know, might Isaac have suffered immediately? And what will he face later on in life? So we need to keep in mind, first of all, of course, the, the consequences suffered immediately had to do with the sort of bad relationship he had with the other shepherds in the area. But later on in life, we need to keep in mind that Isaac had these two kids who no doubt were watching his every move. And the question then becomes, will either of them or both of them learn to deceive as well? Uh, maybe even deceive better than their father did? If so, that would be a horrible outcome, a horrible consequence. But stability, Isaac attempted to bring stability and God blessed him in this endeavor. Remember uh, that there was a famine in the, in the land at the time and uh, that means that food would have been you know, needed by everyone and it would have also brought in a huge income. God's blessing was obviously still necessary as the famine was likely caused by a drought, but God protected Isaac's crops and made them grow a hundred times as much. God blessed Isaac, we're told. God did what only he could do, made the crops grow. While Isaac did his part, he planted the seeds. He thought about, you know, also, you know, what to do, what can I do to bring more stability to my family? And I think that's why he planted these crops, uh, as well as to help, you know, the people he sold the crops to. Another way in which we see Isaac bringing stability to his family line was when Isaac began digging wells throughout the desert area. We read that he dug these wells again and that he gave them the names that his father had already given them. Just as Abraham needed time to become the person that God wanted him to be, so Isaac's transformation also took time. Isaac's radical change is almost hidden in the often overlooked story of his digging wells. Having become rich and powerful, Isaac is told by the locals, please move on. Uh, we're afraid of you. And so he left and they settled down once again in the val valley of Gerar, where he promptly dug a series of wells. Often overlooked, digging wells brought stability in two ways. First, Isaac reopened the wells that Abraham had earlier dug, which had been you know, filled in by the Philistines. 
And secondly, Isaac restored the names that Abraham had given these wells. You see, Abraham's earlier efforts to be a blessing had been entirely removed. They didn't stick. But Isaac restored them. Isaac seemed keenly aware of the Philistine attempt to erase his father's useful and compassionate landmarks, these wells. And so Isaac made a deliberate effort to restore his father's legacy. But after restoring Abraham's legacy, Isaac sent workers out to dig new wells, to go beyond what his father had already done. Isaac was no longer simply renewing Abraham's wells, he was digging his own now. He was not only restoring his father's legacy, but now he was seeking to copy it and to even extend it. This is an important character quality that Isaac possessed in the grace of God. But Isaac's attempts to, to leave his own you know, mark on the landscape were hijacked by the Philistine shepherds. It's doubtful that even the names that he gave these new wells survived. Isaac tested out different places and he persevered despite twice being rebuffed by the shepherds of Gerar. Isaac doggedly pressed on until he achieved the desired result. Persistence, we're told, is often better than genius. Persistence is better than making new beginnings as well, uh, for it cements what someone else began. Isaac was tremendously persistent. But upon digging these new wells, Isaac has shifted from simply repeating his father's actions to consciously emulating his father's values and even extending his father's earlier work. Isaac has become the archetype of the faithful transmitter and, and bearer of someone else's mission. In this case, you know, it was his father's mission, but it's God's mission to bless everyone in the world. Isaac had become the archetype of the faithful transmitter and bearer of this mission. Revolutionary leaders like Abraham, you know, make dramatic changes that alter the course of history. And such innovative leadership divides history into two distinct eras, pre-revolution and post-revolution. Yet revolutionary leaders often lack the skills to make the revolution stick. Following the revolution, there needs to be a period of stability during which you know these dramatic changes that have been affected can take root and they can actually become transformative in the lives of everyday people this all points to one of isaac's great hidden qualities his tenacity rejected by abimelech when told to leave the area pursued even by the philistine shepherds isaac remained undeterred by failure until in the blessing of God, he'd actually carved out a place for his family, and he had created something that would also bless others, all these many wells in dry country. Unlike Abraham, who would complain to God, uh, you know, if things didn't go as Abraham expected, Isaac faced repeated failures, yet he continued to push on with a kind of quiet resolve until he finally succeeded. Don't you admire him for that, for that character quality? It is precisely this quality that is essential for becoming the faithful bearer of God's mission to bless the entire world. We need persistence, tenacity. We need it. Isaac allowed nothing to prevent him from moving forward, from extending his father's work. Now, nowhere does this become more clear than at his next stop, which was Be'er Shava. Now, if you look on the map, you'll see some sort of dotted lines. And you, if you look near Gaza, you'll see where Gerar is. Isaac moved from Gerar to Be'er Shava, and you can actually see uh, a dotted sort of line that goes from Gerar, Gerar to um, Be'er Shava, 
This is, of course, the routes of Abraham, but also the route of Isaac. So you can see what was what. And when Isaac moved to the Ir Shava, it becomes very clear that Isaac is gaining the role of a patriarch. When Isaac moved to Be'er Shava, the Lord immediately appeared to him and said, Do not be afraid, for I am with you, and I will bless you. These same reassuring words were given to Abram after his battle with the four kings in Genesis chapter 15. And these same words will also be repeated to Jacob as he prepared to join uh, Joseph in Egypt. Abram, you'll remember, thought that the people groups represented by these four kings would retaliate and wipe him and his family off the map. And that, of course, was after he had rescued all the people of Sodom. He thought, you know, these people groups would retaliate and wipe him out. But God assured him of divine protection. Jacob, he wondered if he and his family moved to Egypt, might they simply just disappear in the great expanse and in the might of Egypt? But God assured him that they would survive and even thrive, and one day they would leave Egypt and come back to Canaan. Isaac had been told to leave Gerar, and then he was even pursued by the shepherds of Gerar, who were hostile toward him. Yet, God assured him that all of his promises, all of God's promises to his father would come true. And here, Isaac receives his own patriarchal blessing. Why? Because through his earlier efforts to settle the family in the promised land, he had deliberately chosen to be Abraham's successor. He had done what he could to settle down, to make life better for himself and for everyone else. He had deliberately chosen this path of life. God wanted it made clear that he supported Isaac and Isaac's efforts to do this. And Isaac's desire to, to settle down, you know, more uh, is made evident, to, I think, in Isaac's first acts in Be'er Shava. There he built an altar and worshiped the Lord. He set up his camp at that place, and his servants dug another well. These are precisely the same things that Abraham did in the same sequence, the same order. And in doing these things, Isaac is cementing, as it were, his role as the new patriarch. He is made of the same stuff as Abraham. He, too, is a person of faith, deep faith in God. Isaac's trans transformation was even recognized by the Philistine king Abimelech. Much as the earlier king of the Philistines had sought to establish a treaty with Abraham in Genesis 21, we now read that Abimelech sought a treaty with Isaac. Isaac was seen by all the people around him. He was seen as God's new blessed one, the person whom God had especially blessed and, and whom they could go to. I'm sure if they were in, in need of advice and, and help. God had said, do not fear. And so here, you know, you see Isaac revealing absolutely no fear in the face of the king and also the king's military entourage. They're all there. It would have been very easy, I think, to be afraid. But Isaac clung to God's word and showed no fear. Like his father before him, Isaac entered into a treaty with the Philistine, and this treaty stood merely on the word of its two main characters. Isaac was a man of his word. He kept this treaty completely all the days of his life. On the very day, though, that Abimelech left, Isaac's servants informed him of another well that they had dug. And the Bible tells us, and to this day, the town that grew up there is called Be'er Sheva. Why do we read this? I mean, didn't we already read in Genesis 21 uh, that a whole generation earlier, the people were using that same name when referring to this place? I mean, isn't it even likely that Abraham himself had already 
you know, dug a well there and even named the place. Yet, yet once again, we see that the earlier well and its name did not take hold. It wasn't until Isaac came and dug a well and named that well Be'er Sheva that the well and its name became permanent. Abraham's work was not solidified until it was reaffirmed and carried on by another generation. Isaac's work is what made the well and its name stick. So let's summarize what God's word is telling us today. Regarding Isaac's legacy, Isaac stayed in the land even during a famine. That took faith. Isaac planted crops. He was the first patriarch to do so, doing his best to, to make everyone's life better, better and to settle the family into the promised land. Isaac persevered when digging wells, even against opposition. He kept on digging, digging, digging wells until he succeeded many, many times in doing this. Isaac's names for the wells stick, even when he simply renames them. Some of the wells and their names that Abraham dug, they didn't stick. But when Isaac does it, yes, it does. The well remains and so does its name. Isaac then is the epitome of a person who carries forward God's mission. It wasn't his, as it were, to begin with. His father started it. But on the other hand, he is the one who deepened it and extended it. Not everyone can be a revolutionary, nor would it be good if every person was a revolutionary. Our world needs people who make the work of others, you know, take root. We need people who can and will persevere until God's mission takes hold. Persistence pays off. I mean, doing the very same things that others have done can be very good. Doing even more than they did might prove to be very effective as we see in Isaac's life. Our work might even stick where the efforts of others did not, even if they were the same efforts as ours. Our efforts might stick, while theirs do not. So in the grace of God, are you and I persistent people? Can we forward God's already ongoing mission? Can we move it forward? We didn't create this mission. We were given this mission by God himself. And many other people have already worked in this mission. Can we carry it forward? Can you and I extend the mission of God right here in the Walla Walla Valley? Now, others have started it, but can we deepen it? Can we even extend it with our own efforts? Isaac, it turns out, had some incredible character qualities. He was the right man at the right time. You and I have an opportunity to be the right kind of person at the right time in history. If we will let God work in our hearts and especially give us tenacity, persistence, Will you accept this gift from God? Will you work in God's behalf and God's mission persistently? Will you work in God's mission with tenacity? Please join us as we attempt to do this. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this story of Isaac. Uh, his persistence impresses me so much. I'm amazed at, at how he just kept going despite opposition. Father God, would you give us that same tenacity? Would you give us a persistent spirit that enables us to rise above genius, to rise above revolutionary ideas or innovation? Give us tenacity, the ability to stick with something until it sticks, until it takes root. Father God, help us to extend your mission of blessing uh, other people in the world. We want to be a blessing to others, and we want to bring your blessing to other people. Please guide us as we do this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well,
Thank you so much for joining us this Sabbath. We hope to see you again next week. God bless you and yours. Look after you. Thank you so much for joining us today.